Good evening and welcome to the um, Mary's Mantle Consecration. Um, I forgot to put my mic on first time, <laughs> so second time's a gem. Um, anyway, we're praying today for Emily Foster and for Steve and Chris Quinn. We'll begin with our prayer to Our Lady. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Most Holy Mother, whom I love tenderly as my own, in your sacred presence I offer to you these days a preparation for consecration in honor of the stars that adorn your heavenly mantle. I appeal to you to intercede these 46 days for all of my needs, for those of my loved ones, and for any special intentions. Please show me the sweet compassion that you showered upon St. Juan Diego, your messenger. Please give me a pure and virtuous heart like your own, so that I might derive the same consolation, the soothing of my pains, and the lifting of my soul that Juan Diego received from the gentle words that you gave to him centuries ago. Listen, put it in your heart, my dearest one, that the things that disturb you the things that afflicts you is nothing. Do not let your countenance, your heart, be disturbed. Do not fear any sickness, nor anything that is sharp or hurtful. Am I not here, I, who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Am I not the source of your joy? Are you not in the hollow of my mantle, in the crossing of my arms? Do you need anything more? Okay, so today we are looking at the virtue of goodness. This is our 17th star. But to you who hear, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. For if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. St. Francis de Sales once said, you learn to speak by speaking, to study by studying, to run by running, to work by working. And just so, you learn to love by loving. All those who think to learn in any other way deceive themselves. That was from St. Francis de Sales in the spirit of uh, St. Francis. So, how might you put this kind of goodness into practice? Let us say, a person you had hoped would befriend you or date you, a person you trusted has betrayed your affection. Harness the aggressive waves you wish to send them, which only harm you, and immerse your thoughts towards them in goodness. Love them tirelessly. You receive a negative shock from someone. Work to calm yourselves and send waves of love to that person. Flee from serious abuse always. But in your heart, if not in gesture, surround them with affection. Someone has spoken ill of you. No matter, retreat into love. Beloved, do not look for revenge, but leave room for the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Leave justice to God and treat your enemy as you would the Lord Jesus. 
then there will be no need to even forgive. So, um, <laughs> looking at this particular um, virtue that was given to us, it's also called a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it's a thinking, it's a speaking, and an acting kindly towards others. I really think um, with this, it's actually more of a fruit, um, although it's also a virtue, but I think of it being a result of exercising the virtue of humility, of charity, um, and fortitude, along with a deep faith and hope. So many people struggle with forgiveness. Um, and I think goodness can prevent the offense to fester and become that wound that's so deep that um, sometimes our entire life we're struggling to forgive. Um, so, okay, what came to my mind is a lot of times I, I think of uh, Thomas Akempis, and he wrote in his book when he was working with um, just, let's say, temptation. He said, when you know there's someone who's evil at a door, opening a crack is very dangerous because the person can wedge their foot into the door. And he said, it's like that, okay, even with our heart is what I think, okay, uh, with anything. So when evil besets us, okay, like different situations that Christina put into her book, um, and we feel this, that whole um, anger overcoming us and, you know, wanting to put up a wall, nursing the injury. We end up making a, a, um, a gaping wound, okay? One that's going to be seeping, one that's going to get infected, one that's going to um, just um, escalate even the pain that we already felt especially because we keep it open and we add to the fire. And I know my temperament could very, very easily do this very often. <laughs> so um, trying to practice the words of Thomas Akempis, okay, in the throes of feeling injured is extremely helpful. And this is where I think um, humility, okay, is really a huge part of this. Because humility lets us see how truly weak we are. I think it was Saint Ignatius of Loyola. Um, he said that there's no sin under the sun that he couldn't be guilty of. And truly, if we think about it, we all share the same human nature. We come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different families. Um, different temperaments, but in all truth, if we become aware of that propensity in ourselves, it changes the way in which we can actually regard another person. We're never saying that we approve of their sin, okay, of their meanness, of their misconduct, okay, of their abuse. Okay, and we're not saying to stay in the midst of it when then we can escape from that either. But we don't have to attack them in our mind. We don't have to make them to be the devil himself. But instead, being victims of the devil. Okay, um, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas says that we're always reaching for a good. It's part of human nature. The only thing is that, due to the brokenness of our human nature, sometimes what we think is good is actually evil. It looks like a good, okay? And the flesh, okay, all of the different passions can make it seem like a good. Um, the world can make it look like a good. The devil can make it look like a good. And then, once we've acquired it, the sense of guilt, and loneliness and uh, despising of ourselves can plague us, okay? And the devil will point the finger at us on Judgment Day. And 
And so there's this reality of our own weak nature. When we're aware of it, it can really change the way in which we look at another person. It's an amazing grace because, you know, we can go, we don't nurture the hurt and we immediately hand it over to God. And we immediately begin just uttering a prayer for the person who's the perpetrator of that affliction. It changes everything. Um, you know, it also changes the way we think because many times when we have a hurt, we build up all the reasons why the person did it. And so often we don't allow for their weakness, having um, maybe they had a really bad day and were treated unkindly and this, they just um, strike out. Maybe they're feeling ill. Maybe they had truly have had a upbringing unlike our own maybe. And maybe this is something that they've seen um, through bad example or through the media or the games or whatever form um, it, it came to them and has not been given to them as something evil. And so we, we can really um, work on working on our thoughts. Our Lord says that, you know, not to judge others, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that we can't judge objectively. We can always call certain things wrong. For example, we can always call abortion wrong, okay? The taking of an innocent life, okay? Whether the baby is sickly, already known in the womb, or whether it's due to um, uh, rape, okay, um, it, it's, it's a baby. The baby has nothing to do with the um, evil that may have been inflicted upon the woman. The baby's innocent of it, okay, or due to the illness, it's not for us to decide who is allowed to live and who should die. What illnesses can you have and which illnesses can you not have? Or what, um, of, you know, other um, ailments, okay? So this is something that we see, okay, afflicting our whole society and world. So we can always call it evil. But the perpetrator is working in evil. But we can't judge even their heart. Many, many times we hear stories of girls, okay, who have been um, the victims, okay, of abortions, okay, who, who have, um, you know, been brought to Planned Parenthood by grandparents or their boyfriend or their parents, okay, or fear. And they, um, you know, they had to live with this terrible agony, okay, um, following such a choice. And I remember I have a friend named Joan, and she was, she's in New Jersey. I don't know if she's still actively doing this, but she had a place called Life Choices. And it, initially she didn't have a place, but she would actually be a sidewalk counselor. She realized she really had a gift. So she would go with a bunch of people from the church who would be praying the rosary. But she wouldn't be praying the rosary so much. She'd be really... Um, hanging out as close as she could to the entrance of an abortion clinic. And um, sometimes it was raining. And she would actually begin having conversations with the girls who were waiting to um, assist girls to get into the building as quickly as possible. She would treat them kindly. She would even hold an umbrella for them uh, when it was raining. And many times she was able to get in um, a very quick... Uh, counseling to the girls coming into the clinic and fortunately she was able to save many girls from the terror of waking up and knowing that you you've um, you know killed a child um, or allowed that child to be killed and so she but the one problem was that many of the girls who did uh, choose and to have their babies they're like, they had no one to support them. They had nothing to provide. And so she had $5, and she was able to buy, uh, rent a building, and people heard about it and began helping her. And when I met her, um, 
I had a bunch of uh, students who were helping her. We would sort clothes on the weekend, and then some of the kids, when they got to high school, began doing fundraising in their neighborhoods and would bring items there. And all kinds of things were provided. And she also was able to uh, work on getting a grant that normally would only go to Planned Parenthood, but she was able to actually win that grant and was able to get a sonogram um, to help these girls to be able to see their child. And the reason why I bring her up is because due to her kindness to the workers, every one of them quit, except for the abortionist. Also, she would end up going to court at least three times. And she was trying to win over the abortionist as well, knowing that everyone, okay, God wants to save. And so when the person was brought to the court, the people at court couldn't stand this abortionist. And they wouldn't even give him a chair. They wouldn't treat him very uh, kindly. And yet she would bring a chair for him. Because she said, you know, you, you can't win souls by treating them unkindly. Saint Maximilian Kolbe, um, when you do his novena, one of the statements that I believe was his is that love alone creates this is the goodness that we're talking about. It takes strength. It takes that persevering love, okay, that fortitude, okay, that, that's faithful. It is, it's a lot of strength. It's renouncing ourselves. It's, it's going past ourselves when we feel that wound and immediately thinking about the other person. And if we wouldn't want to be guilty of causing a pain, okay, then we can a lot of times attribute it to that person for whatever reason, feeling a need to wield that pain towards us, maybe to safeguard themselves from some fear, um, or maybe again, it's just a miscommunication, or maybe it is just a weakness, or like when Immaculate was given that grace to be able to forgive the murderers, our Lord said they were blinded. These were his children who were committing these atrocities, and they were horrible atrocities and murders of all these people um, in Rwanda. And he said, but they're my children, and they're blinded by the devil, and one day they wake up with blood on their hands. Okay, and, and so our Lord wanted her to have that merciful heart. He wants us to have it. This is this goodness that we're talking about. It takes us away from looking at me, myself, and I. It allows me to look for the other and be able then to have a heart that's full of kindness and understanding, even before another person is able to acknowledge that they've even done wrong. Like our Lord saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And again, a lot of times this can ward off that um, battle that we have with forgiving pains. If we can recognize it the moment it comes upon us and not allow it to become a festering wound, but one that we offer up to God, asking um, for that grace to be appreciative of being able to share a little bit of the taste of the cross of what he suffered for love of us.